Hello everyone and welcome to the Clinical Trials Project Management Series 2 provided by the Case Western Reserve Clinical Translational Science Collaborative. This series will be presented across four modules starting with today's module, the Project Manager's Guide to Protocol Analysis, Key Elements and Details and Anticipating Risk. Our objectives for today are to identify key elements of the protocol necessary for successful execution of the clinical trial and to understand how to analyze the protocol to anticipate risks. Let's take a quick moment to refresh your memory on key points from series one, which we will build on in this series. Remember our big picture? Gather the team, know your stakeholders, understand project scope, manage risk, identify milestones and time, and make sure communication is central to all. In this series, we're going to get into more detail about scope as we explore the protocol, manual of operations, monitoring, and data management plans. We'll take a closer look at risk management, identifying risks, developing a risk management plan, and the process of forming and executing a corrective and preventative action plan when unexpected problems arise. Planning is a key component to successfully meeting milestones. Where are we now? Where do we need to be? And how are we going to get there? Having a well-developed plan keeps team members on track and accountable for their assigned tasks and deliverables. Monitoring and control is cyclical. We watch our project plan put into motion and look out for how well it's working. If it isn't working as intended, what is it right? We need to identify the root cause, develop and execute a CAPA. Let's discuss the key elements of the protocol that the clinical trials project manager should understand to effectively execute the project. Protocol titles can be extremely long and can come across as alphabet soup. They could probably sneak in the word supercalifragilisticexpialidocious and few would notice. The silver lining is that lengthy protocol title can give us some important information about the study team before we even get to the table of contents. Let's pick out the key terms from this protocol title. A phase three multi-center parallel design clinical trial to compare the efficacy and safety of drug A versus vehicle for the treatment of female pattern hair loss. Phase three, this is a later development stage, which typically will have a much larger sample size in the hundreds or even thousands of patients. When thinking about feasibility and resources, it will be important to know how many patients your site will be expected to enroll. Parallel, there are multiple treatment arms, all of which will follow the same schedule and assessments. Efficacy and safety. Establishing the safety and effectiveness of an investigational product requires a lot of tests and assessments. Study participants may need to be in the study for a long time in order for the sponsor to have enough data for their endpoints. Vehicle. A vehicle is a carrier that allows the drug to reach the intended area, which I've seen most commonly used in studies of topical drugs. It will have all of the same ingredients as the investigational product, just not the drug being studied. In this example, the sponsor is using the vehicle without the investigational product as the placebo. Here's an analogy for you. Vehicle is to investigational drug as tortilla chip is to nacho cheese. The chip is really just a way to get to the cheese. Female, the study is gonna be recruiting women only. Pregnancy tests and contraception requirements are highly likely. How about this protocol title? A prospective, randomized, intra-patient, comparative, open, multi-center study to evaluate the efficacy of a single-use negative pressure wound therapy system on the prevention of post-surgical incision healing complications in patients undergoing a procedure. Randomized, more than one treatment is going to be tested. We're going to need to be on the lookout for the process that's going to be used. Intra-patient comparative. Each patient is going to serve as their own control. How will they accomplish that? The patients have to be undergoing a certain kind of surgical procedure, which we can infer must involve at least two different identical sites. One incision must have the investigational device and the other a control, most likely the current standard of care. Comparative means that the study is going to look at the outcomes produced by each device to see if one is more effective, inexpensive, safer, et cetera. Open. The study will not be blinded. Everyone is going to know which device is placed on each surgical incision. Since it's comparative, 
and subjects will receive both the investigational device and standard of care, the likelihood of subjects dropping out because they don't like the arm they've been randomized to is minimized. Since the study schema serves as a flowchart of the overall study design, it's a great visual tool to leverage while learning a protocol. In this schema from another study, we can see that eligible subjects will have a baseline visit with several assessments, a blood draw, and an ECG. They'll be randomized into one of three groups, and the treatment period will last two weeks. Subjects will then enter the follow-up period, which will last three weeks. Using the title in the schema, we now have a basic understanding of the study design, and we haven't even gotten to the schedule of events. It's time for us to dig into the details. I recently came across this quote, the difference between mediocrity and excellence is attention to detail. Having a thorough understanding of the protocol affects every aspect of executing the trial. It will decrease deviations, increase the team's efficiency, help you manage risk, and safeguard subjects. Every protocol has its own characteristics, but this is the thought process I generally follow. I like to skim the background and rationale sections of the protocol for any info on the patient population, but I'm mostly looking for the hypothesis and to try to pick out any terms or phrases that are used repeatedly. These are likely to be keywords. What is the treatment modality being studied? Is it a behavioral intervention, a surgical technique, or are we studying an investigational drug or device? Is that investigational product approved or cleared by the FDA for any indication? Does the study use that product according to its approved labeling? Where is the investigational product to be used? For example, is this an oral medication that the patient is going to take at home or an infusion administered in the ambulatory setting or a device used by the investigator in the operating room? My next stop is eligibility criteria. Are they clearly defined? For example, if the protocol says that patients must have normal organ function, how is that measured and defined? Are there specific labs or imaging that are required? Do they all need to be within normal limits or would one to two times the upper limit of normal be acceptable? Similarly, are there elements that are subjective, terms like in the opinion of the investigator? What is the timeline for meeting these inclusion exclusion criteria? Do all tests need to be done at the time of screening or is it acceptable to use results from that scan that the patient had four months ago? Are certain therapies exclusionary or do they have to have been off of that treatment for a certain period of time prior to enrolling? known as a washout period. For interventional trials involving a drug or a device, determining whether an IND or IDE is required is a key element of feasibility and has significant impact on risk management. Whether an IND or IDE is required is dependent on what the product is approved for by the FDA and how it's being used in the study. FDA provides guidance documents for both drugs and devices, which I would strongly encourage you to download for reference. Your institution may have additional resources as well. Key considerations for INDs are whether the product is being used as a drug, whether its use in the study differs from FDA's approved labeling for the drug, and if IND exemption criteria are met. A key question for studies involving vitamins or dietary supplements is whether the use of the product in the study meets FDA's definition of a drug. Since these compounds are not marketed as drugs, they do not qualify for IND exemption. For investigator-initiated studies, off-label use of an approved drug may still qualify for IND exemption if its use in the study will neither increase the risk nor decrease the acceptability of risks for subjects. Key considerations for device studies are whether the investigational product meets the definition of a medical device and significant risk, or if it's a test or a diagnostic procedure. These are all terms that are defined in FDA regulations. Off-label use of a significant risk device in research requires an IDE. When FDA approves or clears a medical device, they assign a class. Class three devices are almost always significant risk. This can be helpful information to consider in your assessment. The IRB has the authority to approve IND exemption or a non-significant risk study as FDA surrogate, but it is the sponsor's responsibility to provide support for meeting the exemption criteria for the IRB's review. Since the investigator in an investigator-initiated study is the one serving as the sponsor, they are the ones who must provide this information to the IRB. 
The schedule of events provides key information about the timing of study visits and what must be completed at each. Here's an example from a protocol. As you can see, this is generally presented as a table, listing all of the activities for the study in the first column and the visits listed in the subsequent columns. An X marks the spot for which visits will have each activity. Reviewing the schedule of events is an important element of protocol review when considering the feasibility of a study. Are the visits spaced out enough to facilitate scheduling for both the patient and the study team? Are there windows for each visit that will help maintain compliance with the schedule? In this example, we see that some of the visits have windows and some do not. This will be important to bear in mind when scheduling subjects. Are there tests, procedures, or questionnaires or clinical assessments that are foreign to the study team or are outside of our typical practice? Maybe, well, how will we accomplish those? The example includes a urine pregnancy test. Do we have appropriate point of care testing processes or will subjects need to go to the lab? For investigator initiated studies, do we have an appropriate license or written permission from the author to use validated instruments or questionnaires that are subject to copyright? What skill set or licensure do we need to carry out the protocol? What equipment, materials, and facilities do we need access to? Where will study visits take place? If your thinking cap isn't already screwed on tight, buckle it up. The schedule of events is also a key tool in the process of coverage analysis. Coverage analysis is the review process by which we identify patient care costs and determine who is going to pay for each, the sponsor, another funding source, or the patient or their insurance. In essence, what patient care is eligible to be paid by Medicare? It is a complex process that is worthy of its own training. So our goal for today is in discussing this topic is to raise your awareness as a project manager. Identifying what elements of patient care are required by the protocol that are standard of care for the patient population versus which are for research purposes only is really just half the battle. The other half is determining if the study is a qualifying clinical trial. A qualifying clinical trial possesses these desirable elements. The investigational product or service is included in a Medicare benefit category. For example, hearing aids are not covered by Medicare, so a study of a new hearing aid would not be deemed. The trial must have therapeutic intent. The objectives of the study include treating the disease under study. To that point, the trial must enroll subjects with that diagnosed disease. Studies of healthy volunteers would not be deemed. The study must also meet one of the following criteria. Is funded by a federal agency, such as National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control, or Veterans Affairs. Is sponsored by a cooperative group that receives funding from one of these federal agencies, or is conducted under an IND or is IND exempt. Now that we have a solid understanding of the protocol, let's talk about anticipating risk. You'll recall from series one that risk management is a key element of the project management life cycle planning phase. Assessing the project for risks is the first step to a successful risk management plan. Including key stakeholders in the assessment is crucial. As the project manager, you have the thousand foot view of the project, but it's the details on the ground that are most likely to trip us up. Risks could be big or small, and we're going to explore risk management further in the next module. For this initial assessment, let's look out for the errors that matter. These are the deviations or unanticipated problems that would impact the study's endpoint data, the rights, safety, and well being of subjects, or result in non compliance with regulations or institutional policy. We also need to consider whether the study team has the licensure, experience, and knowledge to successfully execute the trial. Are there aspects of the trial that require specialty care? Are there members of the study team that are new to the institution or to clinical research that would benefit from additional support? We're going to revisit the case study that was introduced in series one to look at these concepts in action. Our phase one study of a novel pet agent will recruit 10 healthy volunteers and the inclusion criteria are short, sweet, and easy to meet. Subjects will receive the investigational drug, which expires an hour after it is manufactured. The PET scan takes 60 minutes to complete. While subjects are in the scanner, arterial blood samples will need to be taken. Initially, they'll need to be collected in rapid succession every few seconds. As the scan continues, the interval between samples increases. I realize that the synopsis is intentionally short, but it sounds like a pretty simple study design, right? A few potential issues came to immediate relief as the team considered feasibility. 
A standard PET scan is much shorter. Will we be able to get access to a PET scanner for this length of time? Who do we need to connect with in the clinical area to discuss this and develop a plan? An hour is an extremely short drug expiry window. Can we get the drug from the lab to radiology and administer it to the patient before it expires? Managing an arterial line requires expertise and appropriate licensure. The team did not presently have someone with that skill set. What kind of equipment are we going to need to draw the samples? How will we document the time that the sample was drawn if it's happening every few seconds? It seems that the only simple thing about this study was the coverage analysis. As a phase one study, our trial population is healthy volunteers. So the study is not deemed and the sponsor needs to cover all of the costs. Most of our risks were identified during our feasibility review. That extremely short drug expiry window is a big concern. We'll need a really detailed plan and practice to make sure we get the timing down. We needed to collaborate with another department to connect with a respiratory therapist who could place and manage the line as well as collect the samples. Let's review the key takeaways from today's module. Use the study title, schema, and schedule of events to make your review of the protocol efficient. Consider whether an IND or IDE will be necessary. Make sure that the eligibility criteria are clearly defined and that you understand what elements are dependent on test results so you can plan accordingly. The schedule of events is a key component of feasibility and coverage analysis. When first assessing elements of risk, look at your study team composition and consider whether the team has all of the skills, experience, and licensure to conduct the trial. Have a team discussion about what is most likely to go wrong. Thank you so much for joining us for Module 1 of the Clinical Trials Project Management Series 2. Please join us for Module 2, Assessing and Managing Risk. Please also be sure to take a look at the companion guide for important links and tools that were discussed in today's session. Thank you.